So just going to be talking for a few minutes about the Alkalife study. I know everybody wants to really hear Dr. Kamich, so we'll keep this really brief. Um, and so what we're going to be covering in this uh, presentation is what is the Alkalife study? Why join it? How does it work? How to join it? How is the data kept private and secure? Tips for completing the forms. Uh, just a little bit of update about where we're at with the study participation. And lastly, what to do if you have any questions. Actually, I've got to put this into presentation mode. So are you seeing are you seeing kind of all the stuff on the side or are you just seeing the actual? Yes, slide? not pres it's not presentation mode. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where do I go for presentation mode? Um, slideshow from the beginning. There we, go. there we go. Is that better? Yep. Great. Thank Sorry. you. So uh, what is the Alkalife study? So the Alkalife study is a longitudinal survey. What that means is it's not just doing a survey at one point in time, but rather it's following your journey. And it's actually going to follow your journey uh, as long as you can keep participating in it. And we expect that'll be at least the next seven years. And it's designed to provide researchers with data throughout the journey patients that have out positive non-small cell lung cancer. And it's data that is not available from clinical trials and other databases. And what it's going to do is allow out lung cancer patients to anonymously share their cancer journey with researchers. The study was created as a free resource for researchers worldwide. And we're expecting to have 5,000 participants in the study, which will make it the world's largest. And it's also the most detailed study of the real world experiences of out positive lung cancer patients. And we already have 1,500 registered and we're about to launch into a big expansion phase very shortly. <clears throat> And the study is designed to provide researchers with data that will help them to better understand out positive lung cancer. And these are just a few examples of the sort of information that we gathered, but there's literally hundreds and thousands of questions that are going to get answered. So delays in diagnosing out positive lung cancer, management of side effects, effects of dose reduction, Okay, Dose Colin is Colin is joining us actually uh, from a hotel room with limited access to uh, uh, internet. Yeah, I think this is like Wayne's World or something. Yeah, but, uh, and, is Colin back with us or no? Well, what he, I see he's frozen. Let's go on to the next slide. Oh, he's controlling he the controls. <laughs> It's so, one of those one of those nights, huh? And I, I think maybe the I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try the last question in the polling. Okay, and then if he's not back, way. I'll I have the slides open and I'll continue on. Okay. Okay. You see the question though? Yes, I do. Okay, uh, some are um, you might. I, I can't see the data. Okay, I, yeah, only answer this question if you have registered but have not yet completed all the survey forms available to you. What has been the biggest reason for you not completing the forms? You lost interest, forgot about doing them. I don't think it's important enough for me to spend my time completing them. I want to complete them all, but found the forms too difficult. I want to complete them, but I'm not sure how to get back to them. Yeah, that's actually me, I think. I'm working my way through them. And then are there more? Because that was, oh my gosh, there they are. And I expect to have them finished in the next three to four weeks. No, I was going to add another choice, which is I thought that the disease was cured. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Right. Okay. Oh, Colin is back. You're back. <laughs> I think I think I'm back. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end this, and then uh, share the results. Welcome back, Colin. Thank you. <laughs>
And so the results, read that out somewhere? Yeah. So the results are 40, 41% said that they're working their way through all the forms and expect to have them finished in the next three to four weeks. 24% uh, want to complete them all, but they're not sure how to get back to them. That's really good feedback for us. Thank you so much. 24% uh, said, I want to complete them all, but found the forms too difficult. And we're going to be helping you with that a bit today. Uh, no one said that they don't think it's important enough. And about 10% lost interest or forgot about doing them. And hopefully this will serve as a reminder and get you remotivated. Right. And I'm going to go back to sharing the presentation. I have to reopen it. All right. So why join the Alkali study? Uh, this is an opportunity to, for you to share your out cancer journey with researchers and that can make a difference to your future and the future of other out patients. And as we saw in one of those questions, it seems that everyone here has such a generous heart that they're actually more interested in helping uh, everyone than just themselves. Uh, so you can help researchers better understand out positive cancer, give them a better understanding which will lead to better treatments and better care. Uh, also, it'll give you the opportunity to be invited to join future trials and studies that would be relevant to your particular situation. And I'll just give an example. For example, imagine that you've got TP53. Uh, at the moment, there are no studies or trials um, for TP53 that I'm aware of for outpatients, but there easily could be in the future. And this would give the opportunity for someone to reach out to you and say, would you like to join the study? And also, lastly, it'll help advocates to camp campaign effectively for more research funding and broader access to the best treatments and care. And advocates need data and information to present their case. So this is very helpful to advocates as well. So how does the Outlife study work? Well, basically, it involves filling in and submitting a series of forms that provide researchers a detailed picture of your entire cancer journey. And the topics covered include your demographics, the entire story about your diagnosis, your entire treatment. And this goes into a lot of detail, radiation, surgery, out TKIs, alternative treatments, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, and it's got very detailed questions about biopsies, which is extremely important to the researchers, uh, learning what mutations and off-target uh, mutations you've got. So very important information there, and we really need everyone to fill out the biopsies forms. Uh, a lot of questions about what your journey is like, your survival experience. And uh, again, this is very important for oncologists to learn about what we're really experiencing. Uh, questions about quality of life, a form about physical activity, and a form about diet. And we might be adding more to topics in the future. And not only does it ask these topics, but it captures these at different points in time. So you'll be retrospectively answering questions referring to the time just before your first symptoms. In other words, basically your old self before you were aware that you had uh, anything wrong with you from the cancer. And then the next point in time is when you were diagnosed and how things were going for you then. And then the next point in time is when you fill in the initial set of forms. And then you'll be filling in forms every six months after that until the study ends. But it's a lot simpler after the initial forms are done because you only have to enter updated information. You're not having to redo all the information. So how do you join Alkali study? Quite simple, really, to register. You can either just copy this link and type that into your browser, or you can go to the Out Positive website, www.outpositive.org, click on the tab that says Research, and then click on the sub-tab that says Survey Registry. And when you click on that, it'll take you to a form that you see like on the right, and it just takes a minute to fill it out, submit it, and you'll be registered. Uh, or alternatively, you can get your phones out right now and scan this code, and that'll take you straight to uh, the registration form. 
once you're registered, we'll email you a link to the forms. If you don't see the email in your inbox, please do check your junk or spam folder. It seems a lot of people, it ends up there. So please uh, don't just delete automatically everything in your spam or junk folders. Please do check what's in there. And if you see a email from outpositive.org, uh, please, please look at it rather than just deleting it automatically. And who's eligible to join? Uh, basically any Elk Positive lung cancer patient that is aged 18 or over or their care partner. And this is very important. It's kind of a, uh, an awkward topic, but I need to bring it up, is the care partners can answer their questions on behalf of either a living or a deceased patient. And that last part's very important because capturing that last part of our journey, and we hope that in the future, no one will have that last part, but in the meantime, we really need to know the entire journey and we need to know kind of what was happening in the last parts of that journey. So very important there. So how does the Alk Life study keep your data private and secure? And obviously that's such a major concern nowadays. And the Alk Life study is on a platform called the REDCAP online platform. And this is a secure medical data collection platform. It was designed specifically for medical data. So it's uh, very, very secure. It's HIPAA compliant and it anonymizes your information. Nobody will be able to identify you. Uh, this study has been approved by the Institutional Review Board at the University of Washington, and that is designed to protect patients' rights and welfare. So I've got a few tips here for completing the Elk Life study forms. Uh, first tip is to fill out the forms on a laptop or desktop computer, not try doing it on a phone or tablet. Uh, it's just way too difficult to do it on a, a smaller thing like a phone or tablet. So do it on a laptop or desktop computer. Uh, set enough time aside for each form. Uh, typically it uh, takes a few minutes, but every person's different and some people have a very complex history and it can exceed 15 minutes for a form. Uh, before you get started, I suggest that you know how to access your medical records, your scan reports, your biopsy reports and a list of medications and supplements that you take. Uh, after you've set aside that time, if somehow you just don't have enough time to finish the form, you know, you've got kids uh, wanting dinner or you have to get off to work or lunch breaks over or whatever, uh, bookmark the web page and then hit save and return later, which is at the bottom of each form. And then when you're ready to resume, just open the bookmarked web page, or you can go back and find the email that was sent to you that had the link to the surveys in the first place, or you can use the link in the reminder emails that you'll get, uh, which come from Elk Life Study at elkpositive.org or Elk Positive Lung Cancer at elkpositive.org was the old email that we had. And the last tip is if for any reason you feel like you want to redo a form, you feel like somehow you totally screwed up the answers or whatever, uh, just send an email to alklifestudy at alkpositive.org. Uh, don't contact me or Moha for uh, Dr. Culver. Uh, just send an email to this address here. And lastly, with the participation, uh, we're now at about the 12 month mark. And you can see on this chart, uh, we've got um, the target enrollment. Uh, we're kind of right on target with what we were envisaging, uh, but the numbers that have completed the biopsies form, which is that yellow line, is way below the numbers that have consented. And also the numbers that have completed all the forms is, is a lot less. So uh, it's important to not just st start the study, but to continue and finish all the forms. And we're going to be engaging a much larger audience soon. At the moment, we've only been engaging with people uh, within the Out Positive support group and on the Out Positive newsletter and Out Talks and so on. But very shortly, we're going to be rolling out to oncologists all around the world 
and to specialty pharmacies, and we expect a huge boost in the numbers once we start doing that. So if you have any questions, uh, just send an uh, email to alklifestudy at alkpositive.org. And thank you very much for listening. By joining the Alk Life Study and continuing to participate throughout your journey, you're helping researchers improve your future and the future of outpatients worldwide. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Colin. That was great. Um, if anybody has any questions for Colin, feel okay. free to throw them in the chat and we're, we will circle back to those. Mm. Um, okay, without further ado. Summer, Summer yeah. with further ado, can I just add a couple of things to that excellent presentation? <laughs> yes, please. Colin, thank you. I just wanted to let everybody know that we have full-time staff dedicated to this project. So you can email whenever you need, you're gonna get a response. This is really, really, really important. Number two, we are soliciting funding from pharmaceutical companies. And so what in their decision-making process, they're gonna look at the completion rate of the people who consented. So like Summer, who's gonna probably have it done by midnight tonight, Every, every please complete the forms because we to be able to get pharma funding that frees up funding for other uh, research activities is very very significant and i just wanted to make those those points summer because this is and i'm sure uh, that our friend dr camage is going to mention this but this is special None, I don't believe any other of the oncogene groups have anything of this scope. And that's not to, to say anything negative about others, but to show the vision that the leadership of Alk Positive has, and it's a privilege to be a part of it. Thank you so much, Ken. Very important points. Um, thank you so much for adding that. I don't know about midnight, everybody, but I'll get my act together and get moving, not to disappoint. <laughs> Okay, so for real, he's actually here in the flesh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dr. Ross Kamich coming to us, uh, the Director of Thoracic Oncology and Clinical Research Programs um, at the University of Colorado Health, Lung Cancer Clinic, ALK expert extraordinaire, the godfather of ALK positive, mm -hmm. the one that everyone goes to, blah, blah, just, blah. Just, just get on with that. Get on with that. <laughs> here it is, everybody. If you haven't had a second opinion with them yet, here it is. Okay, take it away, Dr. Kamich. Well, all right, so let me do the bid for Ken and Colin. So what will 5,000 patients worth of data provide? And the short answer is I don't know yet, but that's the whole point. So if we don't have the data, we can't figure it out because pretty much every breakthrough in the lab that leads to a drug, that leads to a treatment started with an observation in the clinic. And I don't know what those observations are going to be until we until we look, but I mean, to give you an idea, that's how we figured out pemetrexid was the chemo drug you had to go on if you used chemo. That's how we figured out initially how crizotinib didn't work in the brain because people were progressing in the brain before in the rest of the body. It's how we figured out some of the weird side effects of some of these drugs. So I don't know, but no data is no research. There you go, Ken. Does that work? All right, you look you're like you're in the Serengeti. I am. Yeah. I am. And I'm hoping to go back soon. Okay. All right. That's it. Well, it's I like I have, Colorado, I have... only different. Oh my goodness. It's cold <laughs> and dark here. It's a little depressing. So uh, Dr. Kamich, we don't really have an agenda set up for you, but uh, I did start out with a question for you in the green room. Okay. That's what I call it. And uh, I said to you, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a situation where I'm waiting to be going to uh, a trial, right? Yeah. And uh, is that going to be ready until February? So, and that's new valent. Um, what happens? Like, do we just go onto a list? Number one, number two, besides new valent, which everyone knows about, because I think they've been here five times. Um, what else do you recommend as a, as a clinician? Okay. All right. So let's, well, let's do the first one first. Okay. So if there's a clinical trial and you're, you know, you go to, a, you go to one of the sites where there's a clinical trial, um, and they say, oh, I think this is a great trial for you, Mark. That site and the research coordinators will submit paperwork, you know, patient, you know, one, two, three, four, um, 
has these characteristics and we'd like to submit for um, a, a space on the study. The company receives that in the order in which they're submitted. And if there's one slot, they give it to the first available. Now, let's say, for example, there's a there's a there's a backlog. So it may be a backlog because they don't have enough of the drug or they're analyzing the data or the FDA is in some negotiation with them. And they say, well, we're going to open the floodgates in January or February. So these people are piling up. How do they work through them? They just work through them in the order in which they came in. It's like going to a restaurant. If they go to the, if they call the, the the first name on the list and Mark, you're doing something else at that point in time and therefore it's not relevant, they'll go to the second version on the list. It's as simple as that. And it's the same list, whichever site enters it. So you can't jump the list by going to another site. Uh, we do have a question that's kind of related to that. And I don't think you can really talk about it, but I'm going to throw it out there anyways. What do you think about the recent results that were, that New Valent um, showed everyone? Yeah, so um, so what what is Nuvalent? So Nuvalent is a so-called fourth generation ALK inhibitor, and it's got two ish gigs that it's kind of pitching. So first is that it's the lorlatinib that we want as opposed to the lorlatinib that we've got, and they deliberately dialed out one of the side effects, which is related to a molecule called NTRK, N T R K that gives you all of the neurological side effects and the weight gain and all the other stuff. Now, there's an assumption behind that, that it that the NTRAC is all bad and no good. But if we take that at face value, not having the NTRAC might be an advantage. Um, so that's one of the things they're doing. The other thing is it works on some ALK resistance mutations that other drugs don't work on. In particular, what's called compound mutations, which is you've got two separate mutations but they're next to each other on the same chromosome, kind of like seats on a tandem bicycle. That was originally reported from Mass General occurring in like 20 to 25% of people. In reality, it occurs in about 5% of people. So it's it's a niche indication. So my first question to you, Mark, when you say you're on the wait list, is do we know your mechanism of resistance? I do, and I have a double mutation, but it's not clinical data. So you're perfect. You're perfect for that trial. But there's an awful lot of people who are thinking new valent is for them when they don't have an on-target mechanism resistance, i.e. they don't have ALK being turned back on, in which case new valent won't add anything extra. I know that we did this at the summit, but just for everyone else that's on the line here, we have an on-target and off-target. So can we explain that before you jumped into that last sentence? Got it. Okay. So, uh, so when you're on a treatment, it's initially working, and we know it's a targeted there. It's inhibiting ALK. And then your cancer changes. It starts to grow. We have selected out a variant through evolution that can grow. Drug companies and scientists, the, the low-hanging fruit is to say, well, let me look at the target of the drug. Has the target changed? And that's called on-target resistance. So ALK is still there, but it's a little different. It's got an extra mutation in that the drug doesn't bind as tightly. That's easy. That is literally the looking under the lamppost of research. So whatever new subtype of lung cancer there is, and somebody makes a targeted drug, there will be on target resistance, and it will be the first mechanism that anyone will find, because you're just looking at the same thing. You so like MAC amplification, MAC HER2. That comes later. That's a second driver. Okay. But if you, but if you, so it, Let's use EGFR as an example. If you start on an, if you have an EGFR mutation and you start on an EGFR inhibitor, one mechanism of resistance is getting another EGFR mutation. But as our drugs get better and better at suppressing all variants, you know, down in the ALK, we're shrinking down to these rare compound mutations as the on-target mechanism. The other slice of the pie, the other mechanism of resistance, is when ALK is still there and still suppressed, and there's another pathway. You've got a best supporting actor who is coming in and helping out. And until you identify that, you're in trouble because if you can identify it, you can add in a drug that works on that. So MET, you mentioned, is right. the, the best example. That's about 20% of people will suddenly find that this other pathway called MET is activated. And there you're adding in a MET inhibitor to the ALK inhibitor. You need two drugs for two pathways. So we started off basically with the probably the most complicated question, but backing up into um, you know, let, talk a little bit about what you see in the future and kind of how, how do you think that, I mean, you've been doing this for 
I mean, geez, it's been probably about 14, 15, 16 years of research. Well, Do you like think that. that TKIs are going still to be, a, I mean, the drug of choice for the at next? The, at the moment, months. they are what you're going to start on and they're going to be the bedrock of your existence for quite some time. But you're, I think what we're, even though I gave you a long and complex explanation, what I want to try and get home is the idea that when you progress on an ALK inhibitor, the answer is not always to change the ALK inhibitor. And that's probably the single most common mistake I'm currently seeing when I do sort of opinions around the world. Is like, you know, you, you know, you progressed on Alecnib, you need Brigadnib, or you progressed on Brigadnib, you need Lolatnib. It works for some people if they have that on-target resistance, but not everyone. And that's the explanation when you look at the data. So look at Lolatnib's data when given after Alecnib or Brigadnib or Seretnib. It has a 35 to 40% response rate. And in kind of old-fashioned medical thinking, it's like, well, that's great. That's better than chemo. But what it's really telling you is there something else going on in 50 odd percent of people? And that's Dr. where they've got a second driver. Like Dr. Patel came in and said, there's a lot of percentage of people that we don't even know. We don't have a test to determine Matt, as an example. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, so I'm going to support him because I trained him. But yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea is, can we identify? If, so we've got this group of people that we can say, look at out. There's a mutation. Right. Put them in the one bucket. And then we've got this other, you know, gray slice of the pie that somewhere in there are second drivers, which we can identify doing the right testing, you know, med amplification, pretty much everything else that can drive a lung cancer can come in as a best supporting actor here. And then there's still a third of patients where you find no mechanism. And that's not because there isn't a mechanism. It just we don't have the tools to find it as of yet. So probably a pathway is turned on but not through a mutation or a gene rearrangement or the kind of stuff we're good, we've got good at looking for over the last 10 years. So that should be the next upcoming advancement in, in determining our progression. Do you yeah. Think? And yeah. So I think trying to understand mechanisms of resistance, which are not identifiable by quote unquote, simple next generation sequencing is the future. And I see I see Judy Tams on there. So one of the things that we're trying to do, um, or several sites, Michigan being one, is to say, look, if we if we get a chunk of the cancer out of somebody who's growing and we can grow it in the lab, maybe we can learn a bit more about which wiring signals are firing. And maybe that will help to elucidate some of these mechanisms that we don't quite know yet. The interesting thing you mentioned U of M, which Actually, we'll be donating some tissue at U of M shortly. And so go explain it. I go and I get my surgery at U of M. They take a piece of lymph node and they build an organoid. They grow an organoid. That sounds like high science to me. But how does that work? And, and what benefit does the patient get out of it? All right. So I've got to tell you the word organoid, I think, sounds fancier than it actually is. Okay. I mean, it does sound like, you know, Dr. Frankenstein and stuff bubbling away and it's not. Uh, what an organoid is, it differs from a cell line in the sense. So a cell line is I take the cancer out, I stick in a Petri dish and I see if the cancer cells will crawl out of it and can somehow survive all by themselves in a permanent way. And that's the kind of healer cells, the whole immortal life of Henrietta Lacks kind of stuff. An organoid is a shorter term culture and they, they, they kind of break up the cancer into you know little teeny blobs. And what's in that blob is the cancer cells and some of the supporting cells around it, some of the normal cells, which maybe there's a little magic going on in the crosstalk. That's all an organoid is. If you look at it, it looks like a thing you pull out of your nose. I mean, it's, it's, it's not terribly pretty looking. It's down the microscope and it's got multiple different cell types in it. And the difference between it and the cell line is it only stays alive for a little while. But a little while in the hands of an expert can still be enough to get some information in terms of what does or doesn't make it happy. So what's so exciting about it for you for as a as a researcher and a professor? Well, it's a bit like the 5,000 patient study, right? You don't know what you're going to get until you start to look. So mm -hmm. I always go into these things um, with the idea of, you know, I'm a sort of professional skeptic, so this could tell me absolutely nothing. 
But is it so blatantly wrong that we shouldn't even look? No. You go into it and you say, well, how could we be misled? What could be wrong about this? What are the problems? But we're, you have to start to ask the questions. Yeah. I know, Ken, uh, I'm not the only guy moderating this. I mean, you, just, you just took over. You think I like jumped in here? I know all this, but I don't. <laughs> but Ken, help me out here. I'm all over my head. But... On, on which part do you want me to help you on, Mark? I think that just tying in, we have a large audience tonight. I think it's because I, I'm back in the seat, but... Uh, That's I, why I tuned in. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> welcome I'm, back, Mark. Yeah. I think this is this is really important. So some of our, you may or may not know this, Dr. Kamich, but some of our our patient community have been specifically going to the University of Michigan to get their biopsies there, so that those fresh tissues can be used for PDX and organoids and and more broad drug testing to sort of not just help out their specific circumstance, but uh, contribute to research overall. And I don't know, I'm sure you you have done this many times, but what kind of motivational reasons um, can you provide to the group about how this may be the transformative way that we find new treatments for ALK patients? Well, so, I was talking about this with our team. So there's a couple of other centers which are doing it. So initially when you start doing these things and, and Michigan may be the furthest advance, is first of all, you've got to develop the infrastructure. You know, how do you get the stuff out of the patient into the lab and it's still alive? Imagine we're trying to deliver a baby. You don't just kind of plop it in a jam jar and sort of leave it there over the weekend. You know, you got to fuss it around and get it to the intensive care unit and all that stuff. So um, that basic infrastructure of getting stuff up, starting the bottle is the beginnings of it. And I think... Michigan, I think, essentially put a, a flag in the ground and said, look, we're going to do it. So they're they're figuring that, and I think other centers are doing it. Once it's in the lab, you then get into another set of questions. And that's about, well, what do I, you know, there are different models. I can grow the organoid in different conditions. I can try and grow those isolated cells. How do you figure those out? What's the most efficient way? What are the tests I'm going to do, given this thing's not going to stay alive forever, to prioritize what tests I want to do? They've been squirting chemotherapy on cancer cells in the lab taken from patients for 30 years. And it's not very useful. There are still companies who'll take your money to do it. What I really want is for people to be using much more scalpel-like approaches, you know, this or that signal in inhibitor, not I don't care if gem cytobine works or not, that doesn't help me. And then the next level will be if this or that signal transduction inhibitor works, can I figure out why? So when something's growing, again, let's go back to the baby analogy. So, you know, stuff taken out of a patient is pretty fragile. You know, you've taken out of where it likes to be. And so it doesn't take very much to make cancer cells die in the lab. So you can put on lots of different drugs and they'll curl up and die. The question is, when you say, you know, drugs A, you know, Z and F make it shrink, is there a is there an overlap as to why? Can you deduce that? Or is it just a random, they didn't like these things? So infrastructure, standardization of testing, interpretation of testing. I think we're really at the beginning. We're in the first stage for most of this. So what do you think that will drive uh, for the patient? Just uh, in my example, um, I hate to keep on using me, but... Uh, so a piece of tissue comes out from my lymph node, goes into a Petri dish, they throw chemicals at it, and they come back and they say, A, B, and C might work for you. Yeah, I, I'm I honestly, looking at for that, but it, is that what most people are going into it thinking? That, well, I think they are, uh, but they're going to be they're going to be disappointed at this stage. So the who goes into it will derive different information. So let's say you have a compound mutation, like you said, Mark. Yeah. So there are very few compound mutation cell lines, models that are permanent for people to develop, you know, other fourth generation drugs or fifth generation drugs or whatever. So you're paying that forward in the sense that you're saying, look, study me, but also study a million versions of me growing in the lab. Right. For someone else who didn't know what their mechanism resistance is, that at the moment is going to be the big breakthrough of saying, look, 
I've tested it every which way, but I don't know what's driving your resistance. Maybe I can find something if I can grow it in the lab. And we and we have Dr. Patil may have mentioned our index case, who's who's Emily, and she's public about this. Uh, is we couldn't figure out what was driving her resistance to electinib, brigatinib, whatever else we tried her on. We biopsied her, nothing. But we grew it in the lab with my colleague Bob Dobel. And he could see that MET signaling had become very active. There was no amplification, no gene rearrangement, no MET mutation, yet MET was clearly driving her cells. And if you put a MET inhibitor on, it shriveled up. And if you looked at activation of that pathway, it was very up and it went down when you put the pills on. And so we added in a pill and she's had a complete response for six years now. So what's your, I know we have a lot of blood donations to the U of M study. Um, but we're not getting as much tissue. So is there a huge difference between the two in this format of what we're trying to do? So say that again, Mark, you're giving blood? Blood donations from people, CT DNA donations, but we're not getting the actual tissue as much. So um, depends on what they're doing with the blood. So if they're just measuring yeah. CT DNA, that's, that's not growing anything in the lab and analyzing it. It's just another library of goodies to go look for. There are, if they send the blood in a very causative kind of way, occasionally you can grow cancer cells from the blood, but that's mm -hmm. pretty rare. So my my cry to people is drive to University of Michigan and, and get a biopsy. It's not a, that big of a deal. Path forward. I, there's, what would you say, hundreds of combinations, thousands of FG1202R plus a different, another mutation, which how well, many... So yeah, so that's the problem is, you know, you've got something that might only be alive for a certain number of cell divisions, so you can only do a certain number of experiments. And I think if you take all of the drugs that exist, you know, there's 36 million combinations or something. So you have yeah. to prioritize. Yeah. Okay, I know we, we, we go deep into the deep end of elk and uh, kind of <laughs> jumped in the voice. Yeah. Mark, could I just uh, ask a... Uh... Ross, to address a couple of questions I hear from the community on a regular basis. So, um, Ross, one of the one of the things that has come up with the new data coming out of the Crown trial is should people who are stable on electinib be switching over to lolatinib, or when is the right time to switch to lolatinib, or should people be starting lolatinib? That's generating a lot of com uh, conversation amongst our group. Do you, I mean, sure. What kind sure. of advice could you give everyone on those aspects? So I guess there's two things. So one, if you're on electinib and doing fine, I don't see the reason to switch. I mean, some people do great for years. Um, the low latinib's niche is it works on one particular alpha resistance mutation called um, G1202R, which, you know, maybe your cancer isn't going to develop that and therefore the switch will do nothing other than just give you the side effect. So I don't switch my colleague, Vincent Lamb at Hopkins, when the CRAM data first came down, uh, swapped a few people who were on electinib. I don't know if he's still doing that, but I, I certainly didn't change horses midstream for anyone. You you raise a, a, an interesting and, and what remains a controversial topic um, which is, you know, the crown data probably suggests that lorlatinib may have the longest duration of control of cancer of any of the available ALK inhibitors and students. So why, why should there even be a debate as to why wouldn't you start on that? And the issue comes down to the side effects. Now, this is where I have to be careful because it does sound slightly paternalistic and I don't want it to sound like that. But when people first come to see a doctor, they're still asking the physician, what would they do sometimes? Um, and, and my gut feeling is no one has shown me that starting on a better tolerated drug, and then if you develop G1202 or going into lorlatinib when you need it, is any worse than starting everybody on lorlatinib from day one. The only difference is if I start everybody on lorlatinib, they get all of the side effects of lorlatinib from day one. So the, the analogy is, let's say for people who, you know, don't have lung cancer, you know, out the, those other folk out there in the real world. And I said, there's a drug here that will make you live from 
70 to 80. You were going to die at 70, but now you're going to die at 80. But you have to start it when you're 20, and it's got a whole bunch of side effects. You know, is that the right thing to do? That's that's awesome. Um, can I switch to another topic? Um, one of the things I'm seeing as I as I work with and hear uh, talk to people, Ross, is that we talk about LCT and oligoprogressive disease as if oligoprogressive disease is one thing. Yeah. And it's not one thing. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that because this, as you know, it's very common amongst uh, patients in this group to be put in this situation with oligoprogressive disease and having to make difficult choices about what to do. You need to find that, by the way, for, for all of us. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll define it, Mark. So we'll start with the oligoprogressive and then we'll work to your LC and we'll explain what all these acronyms mean. So, I don't know, 20, <laughs> 2010, 2011, we were doing the first studies with crizotina. And at that point in time, you have to understand the thinking in oncology was the drug either works or it didn't work. Uh, because essentially we had chemo and chemo could you know vaguely control some stuff. And then when the chemo wasn't working, everything was growing and you threw it over your shoulder and you said, we move on to something else. Whereas we started to see something relatively unique in the sense that most of the disease that somebody had started with could still be under control and only a single area was growing. And we, we could show this most clearly when we use PET scans because they're very they're very easy at, at sort of picking up one area that's growing because it's shown in color. And I remember going down to speak to my colleague and I get down radiation oncology. I'm sure was in the basement. So you always go down to radiation oncology, um, going down to my colleague, Brian Kavanagh, who was the head of radiation oncology in Colorado and saying, um, I know this is crazy, but this person's progressing on this new fancy targeted drug. Could we uh, could we zap it with radiotherapy and just keep her on the drug? And the 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 perfect storm was that thinking the more routine access to PET scans, at least in the USA, and advances in radiation treatment that they could give highly focused radiation in a short number of treatments, what was called SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy, which by definition is five treatments or less. And Brian said, well, okay, because he always says okay, because he's a nice guy. Um, mm -hmm. And and we chatted about it. And as we were looking at the scans, we, we started to realize that what we were seeing was literally you know, Darwin's theory of evolution playing out in a person in real time. You know, the environment is changed. The environment is the drug. Most of the finches die off, but some variant of that Galapagos Island finch can somehow survive and it starts to grow up and it's planning to repopulate the entire world. But if you catch it early, when it's in a small number of sites and you zap it with radiotherapy, the cancer has to essentially create another finch. It doesn't, that, that, information of how to grow isn't spread around the body. And when we did it, I think we published it in 2012, maybe, um, we had to set a limit of what we called oligo progression. Oligo means small number of sites of progression. That's what oligo progressive disease. And we, we, we had to, and, and, and Brian and I discussed, you know, well, what's that number going to be? And literally there was nothing out this. We had to pull a number out of the air. And I think we made it four. So, as long as there were four or fewer sites of disease growing in the body or the brain, we considered it reasonable to zap things. And we got abused at the time because people said we were sort of photoshopping the scans and sure that lesion didn't grow, but there was no overall improvement and blah, blah, blah. But gradually the naysayers went away and it's now fairly standard practice in the sense that people actually forget that there was even any, any controversy about it. Is that number four the right number? No, of course it's not. It's an arbitrary line in a continuous variable. And when we've studied it, the smaller the number of sites of progression, not surprisingly, the longer is the honeymoon before something else turns up. So the best is if you have one and you can add six months before the next event turns up. If you're doing two or three, it's probably three or four months before it turns up. And then initially when we published it, people were going, see, there is no point. You go, well, no, but you can repeat it again in three months time. It doesn't mean there is no point. So to the idea of taking radiation that in the setting of stage four cancer was only viewed as um, palliative, you know, it was designed to 
give the cancer a haircut, but you didn't turn the machine up to full because what was the point to say, no, no, we are going to destroy individual sites of disease, even though we know other ones must exist, I think was the other big sea change in people's thinking. So we do it. Um, is there a ceiling? Probably if you're doing it, you have to think about two things. One is if there's stuff turning up on every scan or there's, you know, five, 10, whatever lesions in every time, it's like, you know, what are you wasting your time? You're like shooting snowflakes in a snowstorm. The other is what are you putting off? So if you're putting off chemotherapy, especially, you know, later line chemotherapy with more side effects, you might want to, you know, really push the envelope in terms of how many things you zap before you jump onto chemo. If you're transitioning between crizotinib and electinib, you, you know, what are you really putting off? I mean, you're not putting off anything terribly bad, so I probably wouldn't do it as much. So you you always term weed the garden is your famous phrase. So I, that, I I weed uh, often and as you know, you, you, sometimes there's no choice but to switch to the other drug. And that yeah. problem like, closes the fine art of medicine where each doctor has his own take on when to change. And I don't think the magic line is there of some sort. Do you think? No, because it's not just the number. It's where they're located and how long was it since the last one's turned up. And well, let's give you an example. And what, and what are you, you know, what is what are you transitioning to? Here's a case study for you. Person's on electinib. He gets brain mets or she gets brain mets. How many brain mets would you weed the garden before you switch to a different drug? Uh, well, uh, so for me, the real question is. Again, what are you trying to put off? If the radiation oncologist starts to talk about whole brain radiotherapy, I would absolutely be switching drug to try and put that off. So you know there's a drug down the road called lulatinib that will do a better job with taking care of those mets. So is it the size of the mets or is it the a multiple amounts of the mets? Because you can zap those with gamma knife or, or SRI. It, it's a combat. I mean, I think... You know, once you're up more than about four or five, I would, especially for lorlatinib, I think I would be thinking about transitioning. Okay. And I know there's a study that was done, and I don't have it in, on my fingertips, but variant three does very well with the lorlatinib. Do you think the variants have anything to do with these drugs? Again, that's kind of like, we have to draw the distinction between an association and causation. So, yeah, variant three has a certain predisposition to produce G1202R as its mechanism resistance. So if you take everybody with variant three and you shove them on up front, they'll, they'll tend to do a little better with lorlatinib because you'll suppress that mechanism resistance in the proportion of people who develop that. But you can have variant three and never develop G1202R, in which case you don't need lorlatinib up front. Yeah, because I know there's some people that have definitely made the change to lorlatinib very early, so. Um... And with the weed the garden, real quick, can I just mm -hmm. ask, there was a question in the chat, are you, if the brain it wouldn't work, but are you biopsying first before you start weeding? So um, the biopsy gives you information in terms of where you might go to next when you get to the point of changing drug. So it's definitely nice to have, and if the thing you're about to zap is in a reasonably convenient place to biopsy, you know, why look that particular gift horse in the mouth if it's in your brain i think in 20 years i've maybe seen about two people who've had brain biopsies i mean it's not what we normally do okay um this is um, another chat question we have and theater or other uh, immunotherapy um drugs any reaction at all without patients well, it doesn't work is the short answer. So we need to be clear in our terminology. So when at the moment, here we are in December, 2023, when we say immunotherapy, most people are talking about agents called PD-1 or PDL one inhibitors. So they're pembrolizumab, tezolizumab, nivolumab, and, you know, Keytruda, Optiva, whatever their names are. And they don't work in health. They just don't. Well, this patient I know is on lorlatinib and she's done uh, pemetrexid. And the Pemetrex isn't working. So um, any thoughts of what other chemo combinations are out there besides uh, the, the common ones that we see? 
which is well, a- so so that's not an uncommon situation where so let's flesh this out. You start on some kind of ALK inhibitor, you get progression, you do some weeding along the way, you extend it out. Eventually it's happening in too many sites or too frequently, or it's back in a site where you've had prior radiation. You're rebiopsying. You don't have an on-target mechanism resistance. You don't have an identified second driver. Maybe you change ALK inhibitors, just what the hell? Maybe the tests were wrong. And just occasionally that switch to law lab and it might work, particularly if you're, I didn't have anything on the biopsy is just a blood-based biopsy, which we know is not very sensitive. So a negative doesn't really mean a true negative. Mm -hmm. If you've had a tissue biopsy, your and it says, I don't have any on target or identifiable second drivers, then you probably genuinely are in the some other mechanism that we haven't identified. And then it's about, at least in my world, staying on an ALK inhibitor, assuming it's controlling some sites of the disease and adding in other chemos. And that means gemcitabine is a pretty useless drug. I mean, oh, that's too strong. Gemcitabine is a, is a, not a fabulous drug. It's okay, it's having trouble, by the way. This has been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> it's, made by, it's made by Eli. Litt. So it's a, it's an okay drug, but in terms of the number of ALK patients I've seen who've had a fantastic response to gemcitabine, it's hmm. it's it's a pretty round number. Unless it's platinum or anything like that. Is that well, so platinum probably would have been with your pemetrexid. So you get into things like taxol, taxol and avastin, irina tecan. And what you're doing at that point, I've got to be honest, is you're buying time in the hope that something better comes along. I would have asked them. Yeah. So sometimes the treatment I give is, you know, there's lots of people have their own special recipes. So taxol and avastin. Um, is a is a common thing that I would do rather than gemcitabine, and I give it every two weeks, and it's very well tolerated. And then those people who are getting those type of treatments, the goal is to stay in the game as long as you possibly can until something else comes around. So let's talk about that. Something else comes around. Um, would that patient be in an ADC trial of some sort prior to all that, or no? Yeah. So I think if you said, well, where is the That's next? Oh, that is from, uh, uh, but people probably don't. I'm going to explain, Mark. I'm going to keep your mind. Don't worry. I'll speak in cloud. You're turning into a physician with all your acronyms. It's like, you remember, you're supposed to be communicating. All right. So apart from increasing awareness of second drivers, making sure people get the appropriate testing, um, making sure the appropriate people are directed against fourth generation inhibitors, if that's their mechanism resistance, where else are the breakthroughs going to happen? So chemotherapy can keep people in the game. And, and if it's well tolerated, it's, you know, I have patients on Pemetrexid and they're busy going skiing and leading normal lives. It can be, for some people, it can be a pretty normal drug. Um, the logic of an ADC, an antibody drug conjugate, is to extend that. Wouldn't it be awesome if you literally had a magic bullet, that you had a chemotherapy that you could send directly to the cancer cells and not to the normal cells? And that's what an antibody drug conjugate is trying to be. So it's a nasty toxin attached to an antibody and the antibody binds to a marker supposedly on the surface of cancer cells. And I say supposedly because inevitably they do have some side effects. So presumably it's also expressed on some normal cells. For some people, they have worked really well, but they're still in their infancy in terms of figuring out who exactly these things are working because it's more complex than chemo. So they're at the point where they're doing tests on the cancer and showing you've got the marker that the antibody is going to bind to. So that's like saying, I'm going to send the FedEx package containing the toxin to doors, to houses with a red door. And they test your cancer and you have a red door on your cancer. And they go, great. But they don't know if that door is ever going to open. They don't know if it opens, what happens when you open the package inside the house. So uh, that that's, you know, trying to draw an analogy with these things have to be internalized into the cancer cell. It's still a chemo. And then the cancer still has to be sensitive to that chemo. And we're still trying to figure out those different pieces of the puzzle. So mm -hmm. antibody drug conjugates some kind of role. Do you want to say something, Mark? Or I, go I just want to say that I know that ADC is not just for ALK patients. It's for all patients. Yeah. Do you think that, have you seen any success with ALK patients? Uh, ADC trials? 
I don't know that I have put enough outpatients on ADC trials to answer your question. I have had a conversation with one of the ADC companies and said, look, ALK is particularly sensitive to pemetrexid. Can you develop a super version of pemetrexid that's, you know, super potent and make that an ADC? And they're thinking about it. Someone might volunteer for that one. Um, well, okay. we to, well, she can volunteer for it, but there isn't a drug yet. So it's like... <laughs> and I do have a serious question, and that is, to our north, we have a third world country called Canada, and they have different provinces, yeah. and some of them don't allow lorlatinib in those provinces, or yeah. their government won't pay for it. Yeah. So we do, have, we do have someone with us that uh, she has gone through all the other uh, TKIs, and she wants to know, what does she do at this point? What options? She doesn't have very much, but what options does she do? At well, this so I'd like to know the mechanism of resistance oh, to see if Lolat, you know, are we missing out on Lolat or is there some other action? Verbatim. Hi, Dr. Kamich. What are your thoughts on taking Cruzatinib, first TKI, then Electinib, second TKI, and Seratinib, third TKI, going back a generation? I'm in Canada, don't have access to the lower Latinib because my third TKI and the government, private insurance won't pay for it. Any options? I don't have brain meds. So unless I knew the mechanism of resistance, I can't explain whether that's going to be a good or a bad idea. What mechanism of resistance and what it could be? Well, so there are rare mutations. That person said it was 1171 endpoint mutation. There's okay. additional information there. Oh, Thanks, thank you. that was like the voice of God. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I1171 happens to be a mutation which seritinib might work on, electinib doesn't. So there's not, that's not crazy. But again, it's not like everybody should do this. It's the right answer for some people. The other thing to throw out there is um, we have a collaboration just starting with University of Calgary, um, which, if you don't know, is going to become the second largest cancer center in the North America. Oh. Um, and there's a guy who's actually from uh, University of Toronto called Jeff Liu, and he, together with the Calgary group and us, are going to start to generate data to try and help get Law Latin available in Canada. Is that crazy? I mean, I've been on that drug since 2017. I mean, I just don't understand why us as a group can't get that approved. Ken, can you comment on that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe so essentially, we so Ken, yeah. we're going, I, I can share with this with you offline, but essentially we're trying to generate data for Jeff to sort of say, look, if you're in Canada and you get this, these are the outcomes versus this is the outcomes in the USA, you know, Please, politicians, can you look at this and take it seriously? Yeah. And we've met with Jeff Liu. And so if to the extent we can help with that, we would. Okay. And, and yeah. I, I actually uh, had some meetings with Pfizer about this. And, and the issue primarily is that in the in Canada, from what I understand, it's done province by province. Yeah. But it's approved by the Canadian federal government, whatever they call their federal government. But... Uh, it's the provinces that actually pay for it, and that you know they're all on, all on a budget, and they're just trying to save money. It's really what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, we spoke about this uh, prior to the meeting that started, and uh, we talked about the advances that we've made with uh, lung cancer. But the biomarker testing, there's a question here that: uh, Do you truly believe that only three to five percent of total uh, lung cancer is ALK related, or do you think it's lack of biomarker testing? Uh, so I think the estimates for ALK positivity in lung cancer range from about 3% up to about 7%. And that's partly based on the diagnostic that was used. So I think you can get a slight false positive and false negative rate with ALK fish testing. That was the earliest diagnostic, simply with ALK. IHC testing, probably the most accurate one is next generation sequencing. And that seems to fairly consistently run about 4%. When you get that 7% number, it's because they've enriched the population. They've, you know, only included people who have adenocarcinoma, not squamous, or only included smoke, uh, never smokers, or done some other trick. But I do think it's running about 4%. There may be some, there's no racial differences that we're aware of. Mm. Um, 
whether there's geographic differences, it's hard to bear in mind. Um, but, uh, you know, that's where your 5,000 patient survey might help. Yeah, it would help us definitely raise funds. So um, I don't want to hog the mic, but one last question I guess I have is, um, Colin, you want, I'll, I'm going to pass the mic. I'll say this towards the end. But Colin, Ken, uh, Summer, fire away if you guys have any questions. Because my um, chat questions are kind of ran out of, of chat questions. But go ahead. I have lots of questions, but it'll have to be another evening. Thanks, Mark, for the offer. All right. Colin, any any questions? Uh, same thing. I, unless Ross wants to open any more, or yeah, there is, you know, more questions in the chat. But uh, I think you've covered most everything. Um, I know it's eight eleven, and we're holding you a little overtime. But just any encouraging words that you can give us. Most of us on the line typically are uh, fifty percent, at least, are two years or, or younger. And uh, typically, I don't know if it came from you or if it came from Dr. Shaw. But there was a statement that kind of rang with me, which is the longer you stay healthy, you seem to have a longer run. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't think I, I would agree with that. I don't think I said it, but I would I would agree with that. So one of the things that we've started to pitch to the research community is to not view ALK as this uniform population. There are clearly people who do better than others. And it's not just random chance. It's almost like 50-50. Like 50% of people will find that they tend to have a cancer which progresses earlier than, than you know, the, the average in some studies. And then the ones on the other side, it's not just like a, you know, it's a, a straight line down. They hit a plateau. Mm. And we, and this is actually Tejas's term. So we, he called them good alk and bad alk or gouts and balts, which I stole from him. <laughs> um, and I think some of the issue is can we reliably predict who's going to be a galk or a balk and then study them separately because at the moment you only know it retrospectively it was like well dude that doesn't help me mm. and we have to draw a distinction between association so you know p53 is associated with worse outcomes but it doesn't it's not a guarantee i mean half the people have got you know p53 so maybe it's marginally enriched for people who do worse but you can still do great with p53 mm. the same with brain mats and all this other stuff so they're kind of you know, catching glimpses of the elephant, but they haven't seen the whole elephant that defines, you know, you're going to do well or badly. Basically, all individuals and just keep plugging away as best as you can. Yeah. I mean, I think they do, when they eventually figure it out, and there may be multiple answers, they, they, they will need to be studied differently. So if you knew, if you knew up front that I'm going to put you on a pill, but you're going to have six months, not four years on it, you might be much more receptive to saying, we'll do a whole bunch of other stuff up front. Whereas if you knew you were going to be in the plateau, this is like the Lulatnib argument, you know, maybe you don't want all of the side effects. Right. Okay, I'm going to say this um, as a cliffhanger for some other out talks. Out vaccinations, everyone's uh, going crazy over those. Um, future, uh, what do you think? Well, so I, I voted, you know, in some of these research things to, to support it. When the data comes out, and and there's a you know there's a big thing called breakthrough cancer which has got 20 million dollars floating around to try and help answer this is to be clear what the end point is i will say up front now that if your end point to go look aren't we amazing is stuff went up and down in the blood i don't care if i give anyone if i give my dog i don't have a dog but if i gave a dog a vaccine stuff will go up in the blood okay doesn't doesn't tell me anything you know, apart from the fact the dog has a functional immune system, but it doesn't tell me that that immune response is useful in any way. Show me that somebody's cancer shrinks more or that they clearly live more compared to people who didn't have the vaccine or on the very simplistic, rebiopsy the cancer and show their immune cells in there that weren't there before. And at the moment, my biggest worry is this is like stuff goes up and down in the blood. Gotcha. Well, we'll save that for another day. But I, I want to give a couple shout outs. Uh, Judith Pam uh, is here. And uh, I want to thank Judith for her wonder. Uh, you can unmute and say hello to everyone, by the way, if you want to. I don't want to put you in the camera. I know I see you right on my screen. But uh, thanks, thank you. I will be involved in your study soon. So thank you so much. And um, uh, I want to ask about the ADC. Wait, wait. 
Dr. Kamage referred to the ADC trials, and I didn't know what ADC was. So Antibody. maybe other people don't know either. Okay. Antibody drug conjugate. There's lots okay, of them. Okay. But they're they're kind of smart chemo. So they're targeted chemo. It's a delivery system for very potent chemo. Okay, thank you. And uh before we go, since I have a large audience here, I want to plug our healing arts programs. And and Dr. Kim, you did ask what is the healing arts programs. And uh Dana, tell us this week what's coming up in our healing arts programs. Um, well, we had our Thank you so much, Dr. Kamich. You started out of our week wonderfully. And then we have Exploring with Writing on Monday. And if you want to join that, please uh, contact Tracy Cushing. Uh, Tuesday, sorry, I have to look at the calendar on my phone, so I take my glasses off. Um, Tuesday, we have yoga with Hanka, but you have to look on the calendar for the uh, Zoom link for her. On our, our Zoom channel, we have the Alc... Alk Singles Group meeting at 9 p.m. Eastern. Wednesday, we have chair yoga. Please see the note on the calendar for her Zoom information. And then we have the care partner check-in at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Thursday, we have art therapy and at 1 o'clock. And the young Alkies meeting at 8 o'clock. In... And on Friday, we have Mindset Reset with our wonderful Heather Meyer. I believe that we have a men's group on Thursday night at nine o'clock. Dr. Chamich, we, we bring Scotch and you have that next week, Mark. Oh, we have next week. You have, men, you have men's group bring, next bring week. Bring Scotch and smoke cigars. Yes, come on in. <laughs> no, that's terrible. I refuse to go to the men's event for a because we have cigars. cigars. Other things, but not cigars. But um, you should come and join us. It's fun. So <laughs> I will we'll try it summer. Sorry. Oh, no, I just wanted Dr. Kamich to also plug his podcast that I did have the pleasure of joining him on. But if you want to tell everybody where they can find you and listen. Uh, well, so it sounds like you're really plugging yourself. But okay. <laughs> no. But, no, I'm plugging you. I'm not out there. OK, so, uh, yeah, I have a podcast called How This Is Building Me, which you can if you put in Kamich and podcast, it will come up. And um, although some of it is interviewing you know, people like Ken and scientists and doctors. I've done some patients too. And I did Summer and and, and Jackson, her son, um, actually only planned to speak to Summer, but I didn't really get a choice. And Jackson <laughs> decided he would like to be in the podcast. Um, and uh, and then there's and then there's a really one which is very close to my heart with somebody called Melissa Turner, who was in hospice at the time I interviewed with her. Um, and I think that's that's a really good one as well. Again, it just helps to just flesh out some of the conversations which are difficult to have. But anyway, see what you think. That is a must listen to for sure, Kirk. Well, it really kind of tails into our healing arts programs. And, you know, uh, there's so much connection that we make with each other through Zoom. And so much, I don't know, just compassion and empathy. And we walk in the same shoes. And you know, we might have different journeys in different areas of our of our journey but we share with others and we make connections and we we lose members we we gain new friends and uh it's a great opportunity and same zoom channel and you can look on alpaza.org for our calendar if you want so um thank you again dr kamich Ken, uh colin thank you so much and uh i guess you can unmute say goodbye Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamich. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamich. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.